published those data in 1998, and we titled our article, Listening to Prozac but Hearing Placebo. Since then, since then, I have shifted the focus of my, well, I still do a lot of research in placebo. I can't get away from it. I really do love the placebo effect. But I also now am interested in evaluating antidepressants. And we published this first meta-analysis. And one of the critics in a published response to it said, your analysis is flawed. It derives from a minuscule group of unrepresentative, inconsistently and erroneously selected articles. He was saying, look, you haven't looked enough at enough of the studies. If you looked at more studies, you'd find out that the difference is a lot bigger than you say it is. Well, what are we going to do? A colleague that I'd never met before wrote to me in, uh, from Washington, D.C. and said, you know, I've read your study. And I've read the criticisms of it, and I've got a suggestion for you. Why don't you replicate it with a whole different set of studies? See if you get the same result. And I even have a suggestion to you as to what studies you should use. What you should do is use the Freedom of Information Act. Go to the FDA and have them send you the data from all the clinical trials that the drug companies have sent to them in the process of getting their drugs approved and their application for drug approval. I said, that's a great idea. Let's do it together. You're in Washington. Get the studies. Send them to me. Keep a copy for yourself. I'll analyze it with my graduate students at the University of Connecticut. You do your analysis at your university. Well, that way we can check on each other and make sure that nobody's making a mistake, and we'll see what we find. And so... Tom Moore was his name. Tom did that, and he got the clinical trial data from the FDA on what at that time were the sixth most widely prescribed antidepressant medications. Now, the data that the FDA has in its files is a very important and special data set. For one thing, it's the basis upon which the drugs have been approved. So if anyone says, well, and I, this is what has happened ever after publishing our analyses of the FDA data, people said, well, these trials really aren't good trials. Okay, if they're not good trials, then the drugs should never have been approved, approved at all. You're supposed to approve drugs where you've shown them to be effective, not when your trial wasn't good enough to be able to find them effective. Second, it includes all, all of the trials that the FDA deemed to have been adequate and well-controlled. And that all is very important because, as it turns out, 40%, 40% of the clinical trials done by the drug companies, submitted to the FDA, were never published. Do you know why they weren't published? This might give you a hint. If you look at the published trials, three out of four of them show a statistically significant difference between drug and placebo. If you look at the unpublished trials, that figure drops to 12%. But now we had the data from the published trials, and we had the data from the unpublished trials, and we can put them all together and look at all of them and see what we can find. And they all now are using the same measure of depression. It's called the Hamilton Depression Inventory, Hamilton's Rating Scale for Depression, because that's what the FDA was requiring. Um, and you get what on the Hamilton Depression Scale is a reasonably respectable improvement in people given the drug. And in people given placebo, you get a reasonably respectable clinical improvement. And now, 82% of the response to the drug is being duplicated by the inactive placebo. The difference, that difference on the Hamilton scale is a difference of 
points. That's on a scale. To make that sense of it, doesn't make any, what does that mean, you know, unless you know the scale. It's a scale on which scores can range from 0 to 53 points. You can get a six-point difference just by changes in sleep patterns without changes in any other symptom of depression. A 1.8 different point difference, less than two points, is clinically meaningless. And you don't have to just take my word for it. There is an organization in the United Kingdom called the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Their acronym is NICE, and they are a very nice organization. What they do is that they establish treatment guidelines for the National Health Service in, in England. And in 2004, they proposed, looked at all the data, and they proposed uh, a cutoff, a criterion. How large does a difference between a drug and a placebo response have to be in order to be clinically meaningful, clinically significant? And they said, well, it should be at least three points. And as you see, on the Hamilton Depression scale, as you can see, the actual data is considerably lower than that. Now, I should pause to clarify one thing, because these two concepts can easily be confused, and the difference is very important. The difference between statistical significance and clinical significance. Because my contention is, and the data tell us very clearly, that although the difference between drug and placebo is statistically significant, it's not clinically significant. It's not clinically meaningful. You see, statistical significance tells you whether an effect is real or not, whether it's reliable, whether you would get it again if you did the study again. What are the odds you would get it again if you did uh, uh, the study again? It doesn't tell you how large it is. It doesn't tell you how meaningful it is in a person's life, what kind of difference it would make in their life. Clinical significance relates to how meaningful, how large is that change, how big a change is it, what would it make a difference to anybody that they would be worth spending some money on or risking side effects from. Imagine, here's an example, imagine a study has been done on 500,000 subjects, 500,000 people, and has found that smiling increases life expectancy by 10 seconds. With 500,000 subjects, I can virtually guarantee you that that difference is going to be statistically significant. Clinically meaningful? Who cares, right? So we published those data back in 2002, and the critics said, the patients in those trials weren't depressed enough. What? <laughs> so yeah, sure, you see, if, if you're dealing with mildly depressed or moderately depressed patients, <clears throat> they'll respond to anything. You won't get much of a drug placebo difference at all. But the people we see in clinical practice, they're severely depressed. And with severely depressed patients, that's where you see a meaningful difference. That's where you would see, if you didn't done the studies, a meaningful difference in between drug and placebo. So how are we going to counter that? I mean, that's possible, right? So we went back to the data that we had gotten from the FDA, and we looked at how depressed were the patients before being given the drug or placebo? And here's what we found. There, was only, there were no trials on mildly depressed people at all. There was one trial on people who had baseline before being given the treatment were moderately depressed. That trial showed absolutely zero difference between drug and placebo. There were no trials on severely depressed patients. All of the rest of the patients were very severely depressed. And they also did not cross this cutoff that had been proposed by NICE. We did find that if you went on the very extreme end of severity, 
there were a small number of studies with extremely, with the American Psychiatric Association classification, they don't go beyond very severe. But within the very severe, there was a group of small studies with extremely very severe depression. And if you looked at their data, you did see it pat cross that boundary. It's still a small difference on a scale where you can get a six point difference just by changes in sleep, but it did cross the boundary that had been proposed by NICE. What does that mean? This, if you take all the people who come into cl uh, clinics and are diagnosed with major depressive disorder, this is the distribution, what you're seeing on this slide is the distribution of severity. And what you'll see is this point at which the data seemed to get, show clinical significance People had to be depressed at a level that represents about one-tenth, in this case, 11% of the depressed population who are being prescribed antidepressants. That means nine out of 10 people would not show a benefit from the chemical in the drug. And that is on the assumption that the people you're giving the drug to are all depressed. But here's another thing that you should know about antidepressants. When you give a drug to someone for whom the drug has been approved, that's one thing. Doctors also give drugs for purposes that the drug has not been approved, and that's called off-label prescribing. So I've seen antidepressants prescribed for insomnia, even though it's a side effect of the SSRIs, for stress, for death of a pet dog, for lumbar muscle spasms, Antidepressants get doled out like candy by some treating physicians, by general practitioners, people who aren't even psychiatrists, patients who have come in, they have no psychiatric complaints at all. Here's a study of how much that happens. In this study, they looked at patients who are currently being prescribed antidepressants. And the question was, what percentage of those patients had ever qualified for a diagnosis, ever in their life qualified for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder? What was the lifetime of incidence of depression, clinical depression, in people who are currently taking antidepressant medication? The answer is 31%. 69% have never been clinically depressed in their lives. Now, they're also prescribed for anxiety disorders. 38% of them had at some time in their life been uh, qualified for the diagnosis of an anxiety disorder. Almost 40%, almost 4 in 10, had never suffered from a clinical depression or an anxiety disorder. Why does that numbers don't add up exactly? It's because some people had suffered from both. So. That's being taken into account in that bar on the right. 38%, almost 4 in 10 people, currently taking antidepressants, have never, never suffered from clinical depression or an anxiety disorder. And by the way, antidepressants are no better for anxiety disorders than they are for depression. So we published those data in 2008, and the critics said, well, the patients were too depressed. Oh, give me a break. What were the editors of Nature Review's drug discovery thinking of when they leveled that criticism? Well, they pointed out, take a look at your data. You've got at least one trial with moderately depressed patients, and then you've got trials with very severely depressed patients, but you don't have any trials in the FDA data set on patients who are severely depressed, not very severely, but more depressed than moderately depressed. Maybe they're the ones who really would show the benefit of antidepressants. I guess they were hypothesizing that the curve would look something like that. Can you see that white line? Yeah, I call it the, the Loch Ness Monster hypothesis. Well, what are we going to do now? I, that didn't seem very plausible to us, but 
I guess it's possible that that's the way it works. We'd have to go out and find some new studies because there weren't any studies like that in the, in the FDA data set of the six drugs we had looked at. Fortunately, we didn't have to go out and do anything because an excellent group of researchers at the University of Pennsylvania did an independent replication of our study, of our meta-analyses. They had, what we had were means and standard deviations from the FDA summary data. And that's what meta-analysis usually use. They had something even better. They had the raw data, the patient-level data, patient by patient, in six clinical trials. And they looked at what, how, mild, how severely were the patients depressed at baseline before being given either the drug or placebo. And some of them were mildly depressed, and some were moderately, and some were severely, and some very severely. And then if you looked at the very extreme end of very severely, they got exactly the same thing that we found. Can't imagine a better replication. So then the critics said, well, the nice criteria, the cutoff, the three-point difference for clinical significance, for clinical meaningfulness, that's arbitrary. And they're right. It's arbitrary. It's as arbitrary as the criteria we use for statistical significance which is five times in a hundred that it could occur by chance. It's as arbitrary of the, as the criteria we use for deciding whether a person has responded to treatment, which is a 50% reduction in symptoms. It's as arbitrary as uh, what we use for deciding when someone is no longer depressed, which is a score on the Hamilton Depression Inventory of seven or less. They're all arbitrary criteria, and so is the nice, so is the nice criterion. So the question is, what would a non-arbitrary criterion be? And the answer is, we found one. Now this is probably going to be the hardest one to explain, so bear with me and I'll try and walk you through this slowly. This is a study that was done two years ago by a group of researchers that had access to 43 trials involving more than 7,000 patients, and they had the raw patient-level data. And on those trials, everybody had been rated on a scale called the clinical global impression of improvement. And on that scale, the treating clinician who has seen the patient at the beginning and throughout the trial, doling out the medication or placebos, presumably supposedly double-blind, rates the patient as being, at the end of the trial, being very much worse, much worse, minimally worse, no change at all, minimally improved, much improved, very much improved. And for each of these patients, we also had, they also had, Leucht and his colleagues also had, change scores on the Hamilton Depression Inventory. How much of the patients uh, improved on average? So here's what they plotted, and here's what we're going to look at now. What's the average change on the Hamilton for people who, whose doctors say this person's very much worse, or much worse, or minimally worse, or this person hasn't changed at all, and so on? Here's what you get for people getting worse, but here's the important one. No change. You would think that no change should mean there's zero change on the Hamilton Depression Scale, right? In fact, the mean change score of people on the Hamilton Depression Scale, whose clinicians had rated them as not having changed at all in their depression, was three points. A three-point improvement on the Hamilton coincided with clinicians saying, I don't see any change in this patient at all. If anything, the NICE criterion was too liberal. It led to rating as clinically significant a change that clinicians, treating clinicians, can't even detect as a change at all. Here would be, a, if you want a meaningful cutoff you should look at what, how much change do you need for the clinician to say that this person's at least minimally better. 
right? Just minimally. You would need a seven-point change on the Hamilton. Nobody ever gets that. Nobody ever gets that. Now we look at our data again with criteria that are not arbitrary at all. And what we find is even the most depressed patients do not have a level of change on the Hamilton that would come close to a doctor saying, well, this person's gotten a little better. They can't detect the difference. The critic's last resort, I call it the true believer hypothesis. Here's what one very famous psychopharmacologist wrote. Antidepressants work. Everybody knows they work. And another critic wrote, clinical practice plus millions of content patients can't be that wrong. Well, the history of medicine is replete with treatments that have worked for millions of content patients. And here are just a few of them. And that's why we don't rely on patient testimonials in deciding on clinical treatments. Instead, we do clinical trials. And when we do clinical trials, everybody gets the same results. Here are the results of six different meta-analyses, some by my harshest, most severe critics who said he must have gotten it wrong, and so they did their own, and that's what they get. I've left out the last, saving the last for best. The last, 2015, I've been shown and given permission to report the data on, on this study. hasn't been published yet. Um, this is a study done by a senior statistician and a clinical evaluator at FDA using the FDA data from more than 23,000 patients in 92 clinical trials on file with the FDA. And here's what they found. The exact same difference that we had found back in 2002. Here's how the FDA's director of psychiatric products evaluation, former, he's, he retired about a year or so ago, had to say in 60 minutes about that. The data that we have shows that the drugs are effective. But what about the degree of effectiveness? And I think we all agree that the, the changes that you see in the short-term trials, the difference between improvement in drug and placebo is rather small. I love the look on Leslie Saul's face <coughs> when he says that. We all agree the difference in improvement between drug and placebo is rather small. In fact, it's so small that it's not even detectable by a treating clinician. To not see it, you have to bury your head in the sand like an ostrich or a drug company sales rep. And it doesn't matter which antidepressant you take. We first saw that, and you saw that slide from my first meta-analysis, 1998, when we looked at different classes of drugs, including drugs that weren't antidepressants, and the difference between drug and placebo was identical virtually identical, regardless of the class of drug. Maybe, yeah, they're all the same, but maybe... See, maybe some people who benefited from the, the, the SSRIs wouldn't have benefited from the tricyclics and vers vice versa. So you, maybe you have to find the right drug for the right person, and what you're looking at data where some people have gotten the drug they need, and some people have a different thing wrong with them in their brain, so they didn't get what they need. And what you need to do, and what we do in clinical practice, is if the first drug doesn't work, we switch to a different antidepressant. See, and that's the way you get it to really work well. This is a meta-analysis published in 2010, in which they evaluated that hypothesis. They looked at clinical trials, in which people who had not responded to an antidepressant were either given a different antidepressant or kept on the same antidepressant. Double blind, and this time I believe that blind was kept because there's side effects to both. Double blind, so they don't know whether they're getting a different antidepressant or getting the same anti being kept on the same antidepressant. And here's what they find. 
someone doesn't respond to an antidepressant, you switch them to another antidepressant, 34% of them then improved. Someone doesn't respond to an antidepressant, you keep them on to the same antidepressant, 40% of them <laughs> improve. It doesn't matter. Here are improvement rates in clinical trials in which people are they're head-to-head -head trials. An antidepressant is compared to some other, anti, some other type of antidepressant, SSRIs, NDRIs, SSRI serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, NDRIs, uh, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake in, inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, benzodiazepine, a tranquilizer. Same response rates, doesn't matter. And that's not considering a drug called tianeptine. Tianeptine is, has been approved by the French regulators as an antidepressant. It's marketed in France, it's prescribed in a number of other countries as well. It's unlike most antidepressants that we have. Most antidepressants are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. And they're also a selective uh, serotonin norepinephrine, also all of them, both of those are supposed to increase the amount of serotonin in the brain by decreasing the rate of reuptake into the, into the cells. That's the way they're supposed to work. Tianeptine is an SSRE. It's a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. It's supposed to do the exact opposite of what the SSRI is supposed to If Increasing serotonin in the brain makes you better than tianeptine ought to make you worse. What do the data show? Remember that slide? I just showed it to you a minute ago. Now we'll add in the tianeptine data. It doesn't matter. What do you call pills, the effect of which are independent of their chemical composition? I call them placebos, and they should be taken with a grain of salt. 